Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this Sabbath study. As we return to that which Sister White has pointed us directly toward, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may more clearly understand the words of this prophecy, its interrelation with what we've studied from the book of Zechariah, and how we need to approach these utterances for our time today. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his wisdom and his guidance as we open his word? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you in these hours of the Sabbath, thanking you for the blessing of the rest that we are being provided. We thank you as well, Father, for the opportunity to come before you, to open your word, to be guided, to understand the things that we need to see now for this time in earth's history and for this time in our lives. I thank you for each one that has come to this study. I thank you, Father, for those that will view this later. I ask your blessing upon them all. Guide us now so that we may more clearly understand what we are about to read. Help us in our conversation. Help us to understand so that that which we need to set aside, that which needs to be given up, that which needs to be removed from our lives may be so removed so that we may be purified, made white, and tried at this time. We thank you for the protection of your angels. We ask now, Father, for the guidance of your spirit. Be with us, each one. For this, Father, we thank you. For hearing this prayer, we praise you. And answering this prayer, again, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This was the final paragraph from last week's study. God is already writing the record of some cases incurable. And then the reference is given to Hosea 4.17. He is joined to his idols, let him alone. The time is soon coming when the work of God's judgment will begin at his sanctuary. God himself is now drawing the separating line. Now, Sister White often refers to passages in the Bible that will be literally fulfilled. Does this mean that those prophecies are unsealed to us by relating to these passages in a literal sense? Okay, explain. Okay, what? Ask that question again and, and the preamble to that question. Okay. Here we have a situation. We are dealing with Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9 within the church is rather infamous because of the application that was given to Ezekiel 9 by Victor Hotev. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. How did Victor Hotev present Ezekiel 9? Well, that uh, that, you know, their group was going to slaughter uh, the leadership. So so that's what you mean by literal? Yes. Okay. Well, yes. I, I still take it, I still take it as literal, uh, but but symbolic. I mean, obviously, a slaughter is going to occur. It's just I wouldn't say that those uh, six beings that do the slaughtering are are men. Okay. So here's the slaughter, well, but just not not the application that Victor Hutoff makes. Okay. So. Mrs. White makes the comment, the time is soon coming when the work of God's judgment will begin at his sanctuary. As Ezekiel wrote this, to what is he referring? Well, Does this he... is judgment that God's going to have upon his, his uh, professed followers. But does, does Ezekiel not make it very direct in Ezekiel 9? that this is to begin in Jerusalem at the ancients of the house of Israel before the sanctuary. Yep. So they'll be the first that will, will end up dying. 
does this mean then that we have to wait for the sanctuary to be rebuilt in Jerusalem? Well, no, it's not talking about the, the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Nope. I mean, the sanctuary here uh, just would refer to to God's church or, you know, his professed people. So, I mean, we wouldn't take that literally. The slaughter is literal, but it's presented in symbols. So are we to believe that when she informs us that Ezekiel 9 is to be literally fulfilled, that it has to do with six angels going through the temple in Jerusalem? No. Why? Well, because it's it's obviously a symbol when we apply it in our time. Okay. And that's how we understand. We take the symbol, and once we have the symbol, then we apply it literally. That's what we mean by, you know, prophecy. We take the Bible literally. It's one of Miller's rules. Okay. So in the when end time, we don't have a sanctuary in Jerusalem. Um, that sanctuary, because of the cross and what happened with the destruction of the, well, the, the tearing of the veil in the, in the, in, uh, the second temple, and then also the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and, and all the other prophecies, we would take them all as symbols. So the sanctuary symbolizes something in our time. It's not to be understood literally. Did Victor Hotev use Miller's rules when he was presenting his understanding of this being a literal slaughter. Well, he didn't use them correctly. If he thought he was, yeah. Because we see the same thing today. People keep doing this. Right. They take things that are have to be understood as symbolic, like the drying up of the river Euphrates. People will look and say, well, the river Euphrates is drying up. So that's that's a fulfillment of, you know, the prophecy of the sixth plague. No. You know, we don't we don't take Babylon as literal. We don't look to Iraq every time it talks about Babylon in, in the book of Revelation. So I mean this is one of the main problems that people have um in studying prophecy, whether they're liberals or conservatives. They don't understand the, the principles of how to study prophecy properly. It's um it's a major problem. It, it exists within this movement as well. So would we agree that if a prophetic passage is to be correctly established, a student of prophecy will analyze the prophetic passage in a figurative sense? Would that be a, a correct statement? Well, so first, if you're dealing with something that is, is obviously um, applying to the last days, then we would have to know that it's figurative, right? So it depends on, on what the passage is, because some things are to be taken just as they read, such as history, events. But when it comes to prophecy, we have to understand the figurative nature of prophecy. And it's done in, in types. And even history then can be analyzed as prophecy because it's typical, right? That's what we've been doing. But often we'll look at a prophecy and we'll see how it's fulfilled in the immediate context, such as the prophecy dealing in Isaiah chapter 7 and 8 is, is addressing the civil war that's going on at the time. But we know that that history also has uh, uh, prophetic implications in the last days. And, and of course, there's a reference there to, you know, the virgin that shall conceive and bear a son. You know, we know that that's that is referred to in the New Testament as a prophecy about the birth of Christ, his virgin birth. So in order to understand the Bible, we need to, we need to understand the rules that the Bible gives uh, on how to, how to interpret its passages, especially the prophetic passages. So in some ways it's quite simple. But we see people misusing these principles all the time. So Ellen White, when she says it's going to be literally fulfilled, she is definitely not implying that, you know, the sanctuary has to be rebuilt and there's going to be these six men that are going to come and start slaughtering, you know. Obviously, the, the group here has to be 
referring to Seventh Day Adventists, not to to J the Jewish leadership or something like that. So even then, Victor Hutov is mixing symbolic and literal in a way that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Now, just another note before you move on here. Sure. Um, you know, I, I always say the passage this way, Hosea 4, 17, and, and, and we, we did study it this last week in connection because we looked at this verse because of the word joined, right, which is right. in Dan 11, verse 6, and verse uh, 23, translated as um, league. And... Um, but, you know, I always read it this way. He is joined with his idols. Let him alone. Or Ephraim is joined with his idols. Let him alone. Um, but the original never says his idols. Uh, and it doesn't say it in the Hebrew either. It just says idols. But, you know, Ellen White uses his idols. And I don't know why that is, whether we just put that word in there. Um, I mean, it's not wrong to put it in there. But... Um, I just I just noticed it, so it's just more. Um, and I looked at all the different translations, and there's not a single translation that I have on my eSort, and I have a lot of them. It says Ephraim is joined to his idols. They all just say joined to idols. So anyway, just uh, something I noticed. Okay. Now this next document is an unpublished. From Manuscript 88 of 1900. The men who ought to know God do not know God or Jesus Christ. What does this say to you today? What does it say to any of us? The Lord has been calling and saying, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts may be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare, it shall come upon all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Luke 21, 34 and 35. The very men who should feel that they cannot do without the most earnest prayer to God, do not pray as they should pray, with humble, broken hearts, for the Lord to save them, lest they perish. Yeah. So it says in First John, I'm trying to think which chapter could be chapter three but anyway it says he that saith i know god and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him and and so really she's saying you know we can say that we know god and we ought to know god but because we're we're constantly transgressing his law it means that we don't know him and it's and it's easy to take this and point poke it at someone else i mean say oh well, this is talking about the men who ought to know god are the are the pastors and the administrators and church leaders and that's true um but the reality is anybody who is is committing sin does not really know god so god, really will, god will surely humble these men unless they humble themselves we have a choice we can humble ourselves or god is going to do it for us Ezekiel 9 will be fulfilled and if it does not touch our institutions it is because there has been a thorough transformation of the heart. It is no use to expect those whose hearts are not softened and subdued with the love of Christ to manage wisely and to show that they understand their responsibility to God. Jesus will understand the spirit which controls the judgment and manifests itself in their authority. There is need of special training under the divine theocracy. Okay, there's, there must be something wrong with that uh, second sentence there, does it, or the first, well, I guess, Ezekiel 9 will be fulfilled. And if it does not touch our institutions, it is because there has been a thorough transformation in heart. Shouldn't it be because there has not been? I have just copied exactly the way that, that it was being presented. Um, from... Where'd you copy it from? This is off the Ellen White website. Um, so that's uh, manuscript 88, 1900 paragraphs. Correct. You know, I'll just look at the. So you know, Ezekiel, for Ezekiel 9 to be fulfilled, you have these six inclusive of one clothed in linen 
that come before the ancients of the house, that come before the sanctuary. Now, their instruction is to slaughter. They are to slaughter unless they find the seal of God in the forehead. Now, if this slaughter does not touch our institutions, it's because the institution and the people that are part of that institution have had a thorough transformation of the heart, and that thorough transformation has resulted in the seal of God. Okay, so you're saying, okay, I see what you're saying. I, I get it now. I was not reading the sentence correctly. Okay, now, th- is this clear to everybody? Yeah, I see. Clear. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was just reading the sentence wrong. Is it necessary? Uh, I was to... looking at if it does not touch our institution. Right. I see. Yeah. So that means that if they're... If our institutions survive, there has been a thorough transformation of the heart. Exactly. Is this literally telling us that our institutions are going to survive? Well, no. Right. Right now, our institutions, everything that we have seen with the church, are being looked upon and examined by the omnipotent eye of our Heavenly Father. Does he want to see those leaders of the church figuratively slaughtered? No. Why would they be slaughtered? Well, he wants them slaughtered in the sense of dying to self and truly living in Christ, letting Christ be shown through them. But in Ezekiel 9, do they... Submit. No, and this no, slot- that's tough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They and don't have slot- the fear of God. Sorry. 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 Theater. That's just that the slaughter is when Ellen White says it's literally fulfilled. She just means that the slaughter is literally fulfilled. Right. It's not to be understood symbolically. It's there's symbols here, but it's describing a real event that's going to come upon the church. So here again. It is no use to expect those whose hearts are not softened and subdued with the love of Christ to manage wisely and to show that they understand their responsibility to God. Too many times we have had those that have decided that God has given them a message, but their hearts are not softened. They do not wish to walk in the path and in the way that Christ would set before us. Of those that understood the 1888 message in Minneapolis in 1888, there were 100 people that attended this conference. We were addressing last week how many of those truly understood the message that was given at that time. How many were there? Only, there's only a couple that did. Well, three. Three, yeah. Total of three. Jones Wagner and Ellen White. Three percent of those attending understood the message. From the time that Adam lost his sovereignty because of his disobedience, government in the hands of men who are not fully controlled by the Holy Spirit has always represented instability toward right ways and great tenacity in clinging to the wrong methods and the wrong principles. The spirit of compromise, the sacrificing of truth and of heavenly principles, and the carrying out of corrupt policies have marked the whole of the history of men in responsible positions. Is she referring here to the government of nations or is she referring here to the leadership of the church. There are hereditary, natural, and cultivated tendencies which work in the disposition of men to counter the work of God. They are destitute of the gentleness of Christ. They do not represent Christ. They act out the hard, untamable spirit of uncontrolled habits and practices. And the Lord is dishonored. They are destitute of love, 
compassion, and mercy. It is not ingrained in them. There is a destitution of equity and of justice and the love of Jesus Christ. Being destitute of the personal goodness of Christ, they cannot impart that which they have not received. Does this not describe the church and much of what's gone on within the movement today? Letter 214 of 1902, written the 31st of December. I received your letter but could not feel at liberty to telegraph. I had written you several pages to copy but cannot find them after hunting in every place I can think of. I will say I shall be able, I think, to furnish something for you, but must have clear light what to do. I do not want to move hastily at all, but I have the comfort of the Spirit of God. Now I say, just watch and pray and trust his living word. His hand is upon the wheel, and he shall turn the vessel as he pleases. I slept little last night. I was taken from company to company, bearing a decided testimony in regard to the men who are spoken of in Ezekiel 9. This was given me to speak upon. I also spoke upon chapter 10. My son, move very carefully. Take, take Christ's yoke and learn of him. He invites all who will take his yoke, learn of me, he pleads. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty nine and 30. There will be no dearth of matter to print. But there is another question involved. I cannot advise you to remain in Nashville with the present company associated together, who are so determined to introduce this even this evil leaven in the meal. We have but little time to work. The judgments of God are in our land. There are places where your message given you of God will be received. But look to the Lord now with all your being. Is this son being told to accept the counsel of man as far as the work in Nashville? No. Nope. When all, as men and women in Christ Jesus, unite in works of benefits, the Lord will prosper them, enabling them to render the highest service. A wise division of labor will effectually advance the Lord's work. Let everyone be assigned his duties according to his ability. Let him be honored as one of God's workmen. This will bind heart to heart. How many times have we found that there are those that believe that part of the message is wrong, yet they refuse to accept Christ's methods? They refuse for their heart to be knit with another's. Let no one regard it as his right to scold or condemn others, for this causes them to feel discouraged and does not make them any more faithful or trustworthy. He who is an overseer should be in word and deed an example of humility, of patience, of kindness, faithfulness, and unselfishness. Can Mrs. White be any more clear? My I brother. Remember, please go ahead. I remember one time. I remember one time really struggling and and uh, thinking I was, you know, kind of lost. Uh, I was young yet as, as a Christian, and hanging out with Sweet Ministries and so on. And, and uh, the the guy the guy and his girlfriend <clears throat> gave me a ride home, and I was telling them, you know, that I was uh, backsliding and. He tore into me like I was a uh, a shame to the gospel and to God, and and God wasn't happy with me, and so on. And I went into the house so discouraged. <laughs> it's like that's it. I'm I guess I'm lost. But then I opened up the book, The Desire of Ages. The, the fellow wasn't a he, he was working one of the street ministries and you know from jail and so on so he figured he had to be tough and rough with people but uh, his girlfriend was quite a guest 
I'm so thankful for the book Desire of Ages and, and reading about how Christ treated sinners. He didn't yell and scream at us. But anyway, that, that's what I thought of as you read the last few sentences there. Thanks, Dwight. No, thank you, Kelly. I mean, the, the, the whole point of, of a lot of this, and I, you know, I appreciate the perspective that you bring to these studies because all of us have had times where there have been those that have been harsh and critical with us. I have had multiple times where I have been told very bluntly that I have no position to worship where I was worshiping, that I needed to leave. I've had to look at these situations. I've had to shake my head with the people that have made these comments. Now, here we are. We have been examining Zechariah. We are seeing that there are golden pipes from these two trees that the Lord sets before the whole world. And these golden pipes pour into golden bowls. These golden bowls are of pure gold. Gold is purified by what? As we're shown in, in the Bible. Fire. It is definitely purified by fire. Why is it purified by fire? Well, to get out the dross. Do we have dross in all of us? Yes. And one of the things I was thinking of as well with getting criticized is probably the, you know, I guess one of the check marks with, with if we are sanctified at all is we feel that they're right. Because we, as we review our lives, we see nothing good in it, and and that even, and then that is where faith comes in yet again. While we're being criticized, chastised, rebuked for, and yet we're not doing anything wrong. That's the experience of Christ. Exactly, because as as you're pointing out, wasn't Christ criticized and rebuked by the Pharisees and the Sadducees of his time? Yes, and I don't want to miss the unique part of that is we think they're right. We think that our critics are right. We don't see ourselves as, as innocent so much. And we search our hearts wondering if there's anything there that could make them right, you know, that would justify their accusations of us, that we are sinners. And rather than the self-righteous uh, uh, response of anger and trying to defend ourselves. Right. Now, Mrs. White continues, my brethren in, re in positions of responsibility, remember that you are not to keep in suspense the men of, and women who signify their desire to work for the master. Express your pleasure that they are willing to enter the work. Give them something to do. God is stirring the minds of men and women to do much more than they have done in all our institutions our sanitariums, publishing houses, and schools. We need fathers and mothers in Israel, men and women quick to discern the needs of those who for a time require help and encouragement in order that they may develop into useful workers. Those that are workers that are looking to be servants unto Christ, how often do they cheerfully bear their burdens when they are always criticized, when they are always being cut down, when they are always being told that they have not done things correctly? In the ninth chapter of Ezekiel is portrayed the fate of the men of responsibility who have not glorified God by faithfulness and integrity. How else are we to take this statement? The is part this, previous where the part previous where it's talking about uh, always being told you're not doing something right. I, I did find that uh, you know supervising workers and so on, you keep telling them they're not doing it right, and they will. It's sort of like if you focus on it, that's, you're going to fulfill it. And this is the same thing in the Christian walk. We need to be encouraged. Okay. Here, Mrs. White tells us, read this chapter. How many times do we study 
Ezekiel 9, as far as the church is concerned. How many of their quarterlies have been presented regarding the ninth chapter of Ezekiel? I think they just ignore it completely, and they definitely don't use Ellen White's statements regarding Ezekiel 9. They don't want to. Notice especially verses 4 through 6. <clears throat> the Lord said unto him, Go into the midst of the city, go through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at the ancient men which were before the house. At the appointed time, the Lord God of Israel will do his work most thoroughly. Here's Ezekiel. What was Ezekiel's position before he was taken to Babylon? Was he not a priest? Could he not be considered as being one of the ancient men before the house? No, I actually don't know. I don't know that much history about Ezekiel and his background. It's always been one of my interesting books, the language and symbolism in it. I believe that Ezekiel was a priest. I, I was thinking, too, about the, uh, the the description of the people going and slaying. Where is that? Uh, slaying with the sword and so on. Can you find that again? Ezekiel 9, verses 4 to 6. Okay. And that, what is the movement that believes that's going that they are going to literally fulfill that? Shepherd's Run. Uh, an advent of God. That's the one. Thank you. Yeah, isn't yeah, that amazing? started Shepherd's Run. That's what it is. They believe they're going to literally do that still? Yes. That's wow. It was surprising to me because there were some people that were within this movement for a while that were convinced that Victor Hotef and the Shepherd's Rods were correct. Here again. That is more than, wow. Here again, wow. this was a incorrect, literal application of what we are seeing in the ninth of Ezekiel. I mean, Mrs. White's very clear. This is a prophecy. We know that the prophecies will be literally fulfilled, but are they going to be literally fulfilled as they are written? Well, I took it as they were going to have a spiritual death instead of a being literally killed. Okay. But Ellen White is, that, says, is, is, is that right? Ellen White says it's going to be literally fulfilled. It doesn't mean that we're going to go after them with swords. Right. That's not what she means. And, and we understand that. I mean, in so many other situations, so many other prophecies, we understand that we take things literally after the symbols have been understood. Well, that would, wouldn't, wouldn't that uh, apply literally by spiritually killing them? Being spiritually killed? No, they're literally killed. That's why she says it's literally fulfilled. Okay. Right. It's like we have all kinds of symbols about the second coming of Christ, but Jesus comes back literally. He doesn't come oh, okay. back. Okay. Well, yeah, we, you know, so you're saying Jesus is the one that's going to do the killing, right? He's the one no. that's going to... Well, these are angels. All right. so exactly. They're symbolizing... Right. Uh, just as long as I get... I, I, you had me a little bit confused yeah. there for a minute. Yeah, All right. They're symbolizing something. So it's going to be God's judgments upon the leadership of the church. Right? So, I mean, you know, it's hard to speculate exactly how that's going to occur. But they are going to be... A complicit with the Sunday law, thinking the reason, that that can save the reason, him, yeah, but it won't. The reason save I brought that, yeah, the reason I brought that up. Remember back when uh, we that um, we was talking about the priests being um, slaughtered at um, July 18th. They was going to be um, spiritually dead. You know, t- um, the um, 
general conference leader, what's his name, um, Ted Wilson? Oh, well, I don't remember that. I never taught that. No, it was there was when Jeff Jeff had taught it that 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 when that when the um at the um Sunday law that this either Sunday law or the at the night at July eighteenth that the priest definitely was wasn't July eighteenth that that was never connected to July eighteenth. Okay, well I be I must be mistaken there, so. But anyway, he, I remember him saying that they, they would go spiritually blind, like Z- Z- Zedekiah did when he was, when Babylon put his eyes out. Didn't Jeff actually believe that it happened a, a while back? I guess maybe not the ultimate Ezekiel fulfillment, but yeah, when, when they rejected, when they rejected the 2520, et cetera, that was, wasn't right. that? How he understood the blindness of the leaders. leaders. Yeah, that's what I thought too. But and in in this type of situation, is this also not being typified by the leadership of Israel rejecting Christ because they could not see how far they had wandered from God's standard. For sure, for sure, they they they're blind. I experienced it in, in living color. I I just couldn't believe it that the way the, the way uh, the blindness of leadership, not necessarily pastors, but just Sabbath school teachers and elders and so on in the church, and try to talk to them about something and like lay it out in even simple simple math, and they just could not bring themselves to say the word even. Right. It, it was really weird, and it wasn't like they were trying to be funny about it or anything. And I'd like, you know, sl- walk them slowly. Okay, so what's one plus two, and then twelve hundred and sixty plus twelve hundred and sixty? What? How much does that add up to? And they just the guy wasn't trying to play. He could not say twenty five twenty. It was weird. Very much agreed. Well, I was I was thinking that 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 was. What Ezekiel nine is talking about is killing. It, it was the killing of spiritually killing of like the Ted Wilsons and all the conference leaders and stuff that they spiritually go blind. I no, it's right. literal. It's not spiritual. Okay, all right, and I stand corrected. Then. She continues. The thirty third chapter of Ezekiel is an outline of the work that God approves. Those in positions of sacred trust, those honored of God by being appointed to stand as watchmen on the walls of Zion, are in every respect to be all that is embraced in the meaning of the word watchman. See verses 2, 6, and 7. They are to be ever on guard against the dangers threatening the spiritual life and health and prosperity of God's heritage. How solemn are the warnings given in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These warnings point to stern realities, which will shortly come to pass, written in 1903. But the many warnings of God's word are neglected. Oh, how sad, how sad. Brothers and sisters, here we are given warnings. We are being given instruction of what to avoid are we to live like those in ezekiel 9 if the 33rd chapter is an outline of the work that god has approved when those claiming to be seventh day adventists are converted when they return to their first love they will begin to work to save perishing souls. What does this say to all of us today? What's the easiest statement to take away from this? Have we returned to our first love? I was going to say uh, first love, yeah. What church is... What was your first love like when you describe it? Like, what does that mean to you? What was it like? I remember myself. Are we doing that which our heart 
tells us is most required of us. Is our first love to be to cast out other brothers and sisters? Yes or no? Some would say yes, but uh, I say no. Believe it or not, some would say yes. So our have first love is... the flock. Have to protect the flock as one reason given. Okay. Any other thoughts? Well, I mean, the one thing, you know, what Kelly's bringing up, uh, I mean, we see this happen all of the time that, uh, you know, for instance, the 25, 20 people, they're going to influence like new converts or whatever. And so, you know, we're going to ask them to leave. But it actually promotes uh, heresy when you start, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> disfellowshipping people. Because people see, see, um, you know, the unfair treatment. And, and so in the long run, even though they think that they're, they're helping new members, many new members leave because of how they see people being treated in the church. So, so it, it sort of backfires. The, the other way it spreads things, uh, I, I was, I was attending a church of, uh, 1200 people membership. Uh, 600 attending on any Sabbath. And up to that time, I was a Sabbath school teacher, a deacon, and so on. And up to that time, I had casually in passing mentioned the number 2520. I never really talked much about it as a teacher from the front. And uh, when th things were starting to get um, mixed up with the leadership, they at one point, <clears throat> stood in between the service, Sabbath school and and uh, worship service, had announcements and announced to the whole church that there was people in the congregation who were talking about the, this thing, the 2520. And people started turning their heads to each other and asking each other, well, what's the 2520? What's that? So I never would have had the opportunity to stand in front of the 600 people in the church and tell them about the 2520 where the pastor did it for me. I thought that was quite interesting. So that's how rumors and also wrong teachings get spread by speaking against it sometimes. I found the best way to deal with, with error or anything that you, you hear is just um, listen to what people have to say, treat them, you know, in a Christ-like manner. And, and I've said this many times before, but we've had people coming into Warburg Church and we just treated them well. Now, sometimes they'd end up staying and abandon their false ideas. But many who had false ideas, when they were treated well, just never came back again because they were actually looking for opposition. She closes this document making the following comment. I am making earnest efforts to win the crown of life, which at the last great day, the judge of all will give to those who love his appearing. Let us not allow our lips to be tarnished by unbelief. Let us talk the truth. Let us refuse to be deceived by the seducing spirits that will come. So, so what's the overall um, so far today that, that we've learned? Because we've gone in lots of different directions. But Dwight, what do you think? Um, we should take from from all of this? Well, <clears throat> we've been doing a lot of study within Daniel 11. Mm -hmm. The whole point, when, we, when we've looked at this from the perspective of what occurred in history with Victor Hotev, we have a group that studied the words of Mrs. White and made quite a few literal applications to that which was figurative. We have seen this same situation happening within the movement. We've seen this happen with Emiliano. Mm -hmm. We saw this happen with Mark Bruce. We saw this happen with Don Frost. There are situations where they wanted to rest and twist that was what, which was being presented because they felt that they had a lot more understanding of the scriptures than those that actually wrote the scriptures. 
Okay, and 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 that would be true. So we see this problem in understanding stuff within this movement, but the root of it is is not so much that people intellectually uh, can't grasp the concept of understanding the symbols of scripture. You know, the the main problem I see is the inability to engage with others who differ with you. Agreed. So, you know, it's fine. You know, we all have different views of understanding things. So we're not all, and we're definitely not all correct in everything that we believe. But if I can't take the time to listen to what somebody has to say and mark them as a heretic, you know, shut them out, you know, excommunicate them, and then spread rumors and gossips about their character and so forth and what they're actually teaching, misrepresented, then I will never come to an understanding of the truth. And so to me, it's extremely important to look at what people are saying. Now, I mean, there comes a point where you're going to stop listening to what people just have to say because you only have so much time in a day. You've spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of years laboring with some people that will have nothing to do with me anymore. If they ever want to engage me, I'll engage them. But I'm not going to go out of my way to engage them or listen to what they have to say anymore. And and so somebody could say, well, you know, how come you're not listening to, um, you know, their studies or reading their materials? Right. Well, you know, and it's like, well, I have, you know, I, I've done that. I already know what they think. They're just repeating themselves. But if, you know, if they want to engage me, I will. And I always do. Right. So I never just, you know, don't talk to somebody. Um, you know, if they write me, I'm going to write them back and, and try to create um, a dialogue. But I've had so many times where I've written a letter to someone and they do not reply. You know, I'm reminded of the question as a young Christian that I needed to listen to everything so I would know, you know, give everything a chance. Keep an open mind is the same. But but then the uh, the old preacher who was, uh, I think it was Glenn Kuhn, who said, uh, you don't have to lick a dog to know that a peach tastes good. True. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I like as we're talking about this subject, I do appreciate that. We don't need to say the names of uh, any of the uh, various fellows fellowships that are around us. We just talk, talk about the concepts because that's really what we need to do. Yeah. Well, sometimes we do. Sometimes we do need to actually address people's names in certain contexts. Like if I'm if I'm studying something specifically um, that somebody has has said, I'm going to use that person's name. Right. I don't believe that we should, you know, use abbreviations um, or just let it go to people's imaginations. Because I've had that happen with me where sometimes, uh, you know, for instance, Daniel Fontenot did a video where he was talking about somebody who was using, um, oh, I can't even remember the, the term now, some kind of. Uh, Numerology? No, 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 no. He was talking about abstract theology. You know, and so oh, I wrote on the yeah. video, I wrote on the video, like, who are you talking about? Like, who's using abstract theology? And he says, you know, we all know what the word abstract means, but he didn't say what it meant. And I had no idea what he meant. And and I don't know if he was yeah. referring to me or anything. Right. So I think sometimes we have to be clear. We do have to address if somebody's teaching something and I'm quoting them, I'm not going to, you know, I'm sometimes going to address specific things. But when it comes to the more broader things, yes, fair we, enough, yeah. we don't think that we can judge individuals. And and so there, it just depends whether we're we're saying something that's a judgment of an individual's character, you know, or, or are we yeah. actually addressing some something that somebody's teaching? So I, I don't like talking when people about ideas instead of people. Yeah. Good, yeah. Good. Yeah. So if you're talking about an idea, you can attach it to a person, but if you're talking about people you know, people's character or whatever in, in just a general sense. I don't think it's a good idea to say, well, I think this person is this. That, and, that, that, that's, a, that's a good distinction that I don't think people actually pick up on sometimes when when they hear their name. It's, it, it's like traveling in a foreign country. When we hear our name in our mother tongue, it's like the sweetest sound in the English language to us and vice versa. Immigrants say this. Yeah. Okay. 
So anyway, Dwight, the time's up. Yep. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together today. We thank you for the thoughts, the comments, and all that, that we have covered. Help us now as we come into the next portion of this service for our hearts to be ready. Direct us now so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to this end. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.